Section 7 of the Australian Constitution commands that, quote, the Senate shall be composed of senators for each state, directly chosen by the people of the state, voting as one electorate, unquote. Section 24 deals with the House of Representatives. Members there are also commanded to be, quote, directly chosen by the people, unquote. These provisions mean that the electoral system for all our federal politicians must be candidate based. The Commonwealth Electoral Amendment Bill, as it now stands, is breathtaking in its contempt for the Australian Constitution. It is a bad bill. It should be withdrawn and redrafted to bring it fully back to comply with the Constitution. All three contrivances introduced in 1984 must be scrapped. Any suggestion that the contrivances should be cherry-picked merely to suit the convenience of three big political parties, one big independent senator or the Australian Electoral Commission must be resisted. If any of the above is not implemented, it would be the duty of a senator to take the matter to the High Court the day after the Governor-General signed assent. Some of these preference deals are very difficult. Someone filling in a ballot paper below the line would be very lucky to get the same preference sequence as is lodged above the line. Voters below the line but are isn't much that, isn't that why they've voted below the line? Because they want to vote differently? I mean, it's like, that's, to well, me, the most, a bizarre argument. I'll they've explain. They've chosen to vote below the line because they don't want to follow the party. I'll give you the numbers. Yeah. The, the last Victorian election, last Senate election, where Senator Muir was elected, the, there were two senators, one, two from Labor, two from the Coalition elected initially, and then towards the end of the count, the Greens were elected, and then Senator Muir defeated Senator Kroger from the Liberal Party. Towards the end of the count, there are only five parties left in the count. Senator Muir, uh, the Greens, the Liberal Party, Palm United, and the Australian Sex Party. For Senator Muir to be where he was at that stage, he required the preference tickets of 20 different parties. So if 20 parties with much lower votes had all delivered 100% of their ticket to the Modern Enthusiast Party. If you look at the below the line votes, there was only 6% went to Senator Muir. 37% to the Greens, 21% to the Liberals, 13% to Palm United, 21% to the Australian Sex Party. People filling in their preferences in their own way sort of went to the parties they knew. But they made the choice to vote below the line so they could do that. 100% so of people who voted below the line made the choice they didn't want to follow a party ticket. And how many people would have made that choice if they didn't have to fill in 93 numbers? So you object to the number of people The choice is asymmetrical. Below the line, you don't have to be a registered... You have been herding people be above the line for the last three decades by making the choice of how to vote asymmetrical. You can walk in, or you can vote one, or you've got to fill in every box below the line. It's a herding process to make people vote above the line. I, th I think that Senator Day said earlier today, um, what's wrong with people who trust their parties to vote one above the line? Honestly, I think in this case we can have our cake and eat it too. Six below the line or one above the line. Is it true in your view that the more parties that are registered and part of a grouping of parties exchanging preferences via group voting tickets are greater the chance that one of them will be elected? Uh, mathematically, that theory would be correct, yes. So that's been the basis of how you have worked in terms of running those forums and running the round robins that you have um, organised to inform people that they have a chance of getting elected. So that's the basis of it? No, that's not the basis. So what is the basis, please? Uh, minor parties should work together, in my opinion, before they deal with the major parties. And my advice to minor parties is to where they can exchange preferences amongst themselves. Obviously, there are sometimes philosophical reasons why that can't happen. At what point, Mr Jury, in these discussions, do you, when you're providing advice to these parties, consider the linkage between the party name and actually the party philosophy that underpins that political party? So that when voters are making a choice, if they're voting for um, the party, where do they, how do they know that Look, party this is, stands... really, this is really a question for um, any given individual or group that comes to me. It's not a question for me. Uh, I will make suggestions on, on names, of course, but, but if somebody comes to me that represents, a, say, a Christian group... Um, okay, so in, so in your advice, there's no... So in your advice, it's about how to manipulate the system. It's not about how to link 
or how to it's develop a philosophy. It's not about how to manipulate the system at all. Or a name. It's about how to work within the system when that does, people like you when have When does put the there. voters' intent, so when you're advising on how to do group voting tickets and do the preference deals... I'm sorry, can you repeat the last one? At what point do voters, like the people up in the, uh, in the gallery now, at what point does their will come into it? Well, when they walk in to, to vote. 